fail in the matter of Deutsche Bank AG and Vic and another. May it please the court. I appear for the appellant, Deutsche Bank AG. My learned friend, Mr. Tom Morris, appears for the respondent, Mr. Alexander Vic. Yes. This appeal concerns the meaning of the phrase, the date on which the interest became due in section 24.2 of the Act 1980. Um, and its application, or the application of that meaning, to a non-party costs order made against Mr. Vick in the course of long-running commercial litigation. Mrs. Justice Diaz, in the court below, held that that phrase, the date on which the interest became due, refers to the date on which the liability to pay the interest was first incurred. In other words, the point at which it becomes certain that there will be some form of liability. The appellant submits that that is not the correct meaning, that the correct meaning of the phrase, the date on which the interest became due, is the date on which the liability is payable. That meaning accords with the most common understanding of the phrase, and the partic in particular the words became due. It also accords with prior binding authority from this court, and in application to the costs order, which is the subject of this appeal, it is also the most meritorious construction to be applied. Now, proposed to structure... Just, just yes, before you go on, if I can just tell you, we've um, all had the opportunity of reading into the case extensively. So we've read the judgments of the skeleton arguments and dipped into the relevant authorities. I'm, I'm grateful for that indication, my lady. I was proposing to structure my submission slightly differently to the way in which I've set them out in my skeleton argument. First to deal and to go immediately to the text of the statute itself and the, the proper approach to the interpretation of it. Second, to consider the judge's approach to the two appellate authorities um, that are in firm dispute between the parties, Walters and Toft. Um, third, to consider the relevance and then, if relevant, the significance of the legislative history of Section 24.2. And fourth and finally, to consider our backup ground of appeal, that is, if Mrs Justice Dias's interpretation of the section is correct, Nonetheless, we contend that it was applied incorrectly and a different result should have been determined. Turning then to the first of those four parts, which is the interpretation of section 24, um, I propose to take it in two sections. First, to address what we say is the correct meaning of 24.2 and in particular the relevant phrase, as well as the correct approach to ascertaining that meaning. And then second, to deal with the way that the judge below dealt with that and the way in which she, say, we say she fell into error. Um, the starting point for the first of those points is obviously the text of the statute. And if I could invite your lady and uh, your lordships to uh, pick up the 1980 Act, which is volume one of the authorities bundle behind tab five, starting um, at page 33 in the electronic bundle. So as the preamble states, this is a consolidation statute consolidating the previous 1939 consolidation and amendments or enactments made thereafter. Section 24 is in part one of the Act, which begins over the page, page 34, and that's titled Ordinary Time Limits for Different Classes of Action. Section 1, subsection 1, explains the purpose of those provisions. It states, this part of this Act uh, gives the ordinary time limits for bringing actions of the various classes mentioned and the following provisions, in the following provisions of this part. The remainder of part one is then arranged in categories under general headings describing different types of claims. Most of those sections refer to time limits or additional or special time limits and provide for limitation periods. Um, most common examples of that your lordships and your ladyship will be familiar with section two and section five. Section 24 is at page 52 of the authority bundle. I'm going to ask you to turn to that. It appears amongst a group of sections headed miscellaneous and supplemental. And the section itself is titled Time Limit for Actions to Enforce Judgments. Just pausing there, perhaps to emphasize why I've labored over that approach to the act. Um, what is the interpretive significance of the arrangement and these other features that I've drawn attention to? Well, we say individually and collectively, they suggest that the provisions of part one, 
um, are of a piece. They impose time limits that are intended to operate in similar fashion. Hence their arrangement and the collective epithet ordinary, and the inference therefore to be drawn is that they are to be given a congruent construction. Turning then specifically to section 24, subsection one concerns the time limit for an action or judgment. It's not an issue uh, in this case. Subsection two is the section that's an issue. There are two clauses within it. The first, no arrears of interest in respect of any judgment debt shall be recovered. The meaning of that first clause was considered in Lousley and Forbes. And I'll return to Lousley in a moment, what we say about it. The second clause is the one in issue here. That is, after the expiration of six years from the date on which the interest became due. No authority prior to Mrs Justice Diaz's decision had considered the meaning of that clause. Looking then at the words themselves, we've set out in my skeleton argument at paragraph 37.1, what we say is the ordinary natural meaning of become due based on dictionary references. We say that become due is becoming owing or payable, and that when used in the phrase become due means immediately payable. That's also supported, we say, by the reference in the text to arrears. So at the beginning of section 24, subsection two, no arrears of interest in respect of any judgment debt shall be recovered. And the reference at the end of the sentence to interest is a reference back to arrears of interest. No arrears or arrears of interest cannot arise unless or until the interest itself has become payable. Otherwise, there would be no meaning to attribute to arrears. There are also other cases um, that establish that the ordinary and natural meaning of the word due or become due um, is become payable. I'm not proposing to take the court to all of those, but if I could just take uh, your ladyship and your lordships to Carlsberg, which is in the second volume of authorities behind tab 28. Carlsberg concerned the liability to pay duty on beer and the operation of a rounding down exercise under the relevant legislation. And in issue was what was due, what due meant in two pieces of legislation. The first was section 36 subsection two of the Alcoholic Liquor Duties Act 1979. And um, if you turn to page 315 of the bundle at paragraph 11, that section is set out there. Subsection B provides the amount chargeable in respect of any such duty shall be determined and become due. And the other provision that was relevant for present purposes is section 137, subsection 4 of the Customs and Excise Management Act, 1979. And that's set out at paragraph 24 on page 317 of the bundle. Master of the Rolls, Lord Newberger, gave the judgment with which the other members of the Court of Appeal agreed. And at paragraph 39 and 40, which is on page 319 of the authorities bundle, um, he considered what due and become due meant in those provisions. I might invite your ladyship, your lordships, to read that. Certainly. So we say that provides firm support for the primary position that we've taken in reliance on the dictionary definitions of what become due means. 
Now, the phrase became Jew is used elsewhere in the Limitation Act 1980. Um, if I could just ask you to turn up those provisions, and I'll take you through them briefly. So we're back in volume one of the authority file, beginning at page 59. Sorry, page 49 of the authorities bundle. <clears throat> Section 19 is at the bottom of the page, titled Time Limit for Actions to Recover Rent. And it provides no action shall be brought, and the power conferred by tribunals, courts, and enforcement act, that is the power to distrain, or what used to be called distrain, shall not be exercisable to recover arrears of rent or damages in respect of the arrears after the expiration of six years from the date on which the arrears became due. Then in section 20, which begins over the page, in the section titled Actions to Recover Money Secured by Mortgage or Charge, section 20, in the first four subsections, provides for time limits in relation to the recovery of money secured by a mortgage, but subsection five concerns interest on such sums. I might just invite the ladyship, your lordships, to read that. The relevant phrase obviously appearing at the end, from the date on which the interest became due. Is there any significance in the change of language from accrual in the first or subsections to became due from the fifth? We say there isn't. Um, we say that it reflects um, the way in which interest operates. Um, now, the reason why I say it isn't is because the time limits it itself should operate in the same way that any other limitation period should operate. But in relation to interest, interest can accrue even before it becomes due. And hence, using accrual in subsection five would introduce an ambiguity. So it's on that basis that um, we say became due um, bears the meaning that we say it does, um, and the reason why there would be a distinction between the other subsections of section 20. Um, okay. There is also obviously a historical reason for it, given that subsection five derived from section 42 of the 1833 Act, where became due um, was the phrase that was used. The final provision that I wanted to take your ladyship and your lordships to is section 22, which is on page 52. 22 concerns time limits for claims in relation to a personal estate. And subsection B concerns interest in respect of any legacy. Again, the phrase at the end, the date on which the interest became due. Plainly, the repeated use of, of that phrase has an interpretive significance for understanding the way in which interest became due should be construed in section 24.2. In other words, that any authority concerning the meaning of that phrase elsewhere in the Act um, ought to be given uh, prominence and precedence, we say, in relation to construing it in relation to section 24.2. Um, that is where the decision of Walters comes in. Um, I just invite your ladyship and your lordships to turn that up behind tab 16 of volume one of the authorities bundle. Unless it would assist your ladyship or your lordship, I'm not proposing to go into the facts, given that I suspect you likely read Walters, if not once, then more than once. Um, but the key relevance of Walters for the present case is that there was a distinction between when the liability to pay interest was incurred in relation to the loan that Mr. Walters had taken out, and also the date on which that interest accrued, picking up the question that my Lord Lord Justice Mayles had put to me, and the date on which that interest was held to have become due. Now, we say in looking at Walters and what the decision was in that case, uh, fundamental but fairly basic point needs to be borne in mind, that there is a conceptual distinction between the exercise of identifying the meaning of the words of the statute and then applying it to the particular facts in issue. 
and the ratio of Walters needs to be understood with that conceptual distinction borne closely in mind. Um, the point that was raised on the appeal is at page 148 of the authorities bundle at the bottom. Mr. Walters sounds as if he was a slightly difficult client and had sought to run an argument himself that counsel wasn't willing to put. But this argument was actually put by counsel and was the subject of the appeal um, as it was originally brought. And so the, the argument that was put was that the interest that the bank was entitled to recover um, from the proceeds of the sale of the property that had been mortgaged was limited to six years back from um, the date on which that claim had been brought, so six years of interest. Um, the bank had resisted that and had suggested that it was entitled to interest um, from the outset um, because the interest hadn't yet become payable and therefore hadn't become due. So it was an exact example of um, the sort of argument that Mr. Vick rang below, in other words, that interest is not due when it becomes payable. Lord Justice Nichols gave relatively short shrift, but nonetheless detailed consideration to the reasoning supporting that argument over the page at page 149, about halfway down the page. Um, he refers to, uh, sorry, I should just take one step back. Um, he refers to, in the first paragraph, subsections six and seven, which don't arise on the appeal, but he clearly had those provisions in mind. And then halfway down the page, in the middle of the paragraph, beginning with a sentence, the word due, due in the phrase from the date on which the interest became due, in my opinion, means due for payment. And due for payment means due for payment in accordance with whatever terms have been agreed between the parties to that end. Can I just break those two sentences in two? Because the first part of that sentence concerns the first conceptual distinction, the first part of the conceptual distinction I referred to. In other words, Lord Justice Nichols held that became due in the statute means became payable. The reference thereafter to whatever the terms have been agreed between the parties involves the application of that meaning to the particular facts that were in issue. Um, obviously, there being a contract that formed the basis of the claim, that is the reason why that was relevant. Nonetheless, it doesn't take away from the point that this, the ratio of the decision is that became due in section 25 um, means became payable. It goes on a little bit, or two lines down. Plainly, the bank could not have sued for the interest until the end of that period, that is the end of the five years when the principal or interest um, was payable. Interest would be debited by the bank to Mr. Walter's account in the ordinary way at intervals during the five year period, but it would not become due for payment, or in my view, due within section 20, subsection five until expiration of the five year period. Now, that also provides a firm policy reason um, that Lord Justice Nichols was moved by to support the construction that he took. In other words, the purpose of limitation periods, um, or the purpose identified by Lord Justice Nichols implicitly, uh, was to reflect that a party should take action um, or should be able to take action during the course of the time limit running. Um, if a party is unable to take action or legally precluded from doing so to enforce the relevant claim, then plainly the time limit will suggest that in a construction whereby the time limit is running during that period is not or is odd not consistent with the purpose of the statute or the provision. That is as far as um, either party has been able to turn up, the only decision on the phrase, the interest, when the interest became due. Um, I've, I've referenced in my skeleton argument, Bellow, an ideal view, um, a case on section 19 concerning rent. Sorry, and when rent- we leave yes. Bank and Walters, is there a knot missing at page 150? Well, Justice Nichols goes on to consider what the nature of the agreement in this case was uh, and cites what the judge has said about it. And then it says, it seems to me that that is, uh, I think there may be a missing knot. Correct, yes. Satisfactory that, that, that's my reading of it. Yeah. I, I should note that at page 146 of the authorities bundle, in this version of the judgment, it suggests that the judgment, although extempore, was revised, so presumably went back to the judges before the transcript. But that does appear to be a typographical error, otherwise the paragraph would not make sense. 
And, and of course, that, that passage, which was relied on by Mr. Vick in the court below, um, only simply goes to the factual basis that uh, in which the point arose, whether there was evidence or not um, on, that, on that particular point. But it doesn't take away, not that I think your Lordship was suggesting that to me, but it doesn't take away from the ratio in relation to the meaning of the words became due in that particular subsection. Um, I was about to move on to Lousley and Forbes. Um, Lousley is at tab 20 of volume one of the authorities. I had said at the outset that Lousley had considered section 24.2, but had only considered the first clause of section 24.2. Um, and in fact, it also considered 24.1 and is mostly known as an authority in relation to the meaning of section 24.1. And Lord Lloyd gave the only reasoned speech um, in, in, that, in that case with a particular strong appellate committee, Lord Hoffman, Lord Nolan, Lord Hope, Lord Brown Wilkinson. Um, he upheld the lower court's decision in relation to section 24.1. Um, uh, but, but disagreed with the Court of Appeal in some other respects. Now, there were three separate issues um, in Lousley that are important to bear in mind in terms of the way in which Lord Lloyd then considered the points later. The first was whether Section 24, Subsection 1 applied to enforcement proceedings and not only to a claim or an action brought on the judgment itself. The second was the point that I referred to in relation to section 24.2. That is whether the words recovered in section 24.2 referred only to actions on a judgment or also applied to enforcement. And the third was if section 24.2 applied also to um, actions on a judgment and enforcement, whether section 32 might apply and extend the time limit otherwise applicable. Um, on that first issue, as I mentioned, Lord Lloyd uh, upheld the Court of Appeals decision, and so um, action for the purposes of Section 24.1 means a fresh action and doesn't include proceedings for enforcement. So in other words, Section 24.1 has nothing to do with an enforcement step or enforcement proceedings, such as charging or garnishing orders. Um, Lord Lloyd, however, disagreed with the Court of Appeal in relation to the second issue, the meaning of recovered or recovery of interest under Section 24.2. Uh, if we pick up the judgment at page 216 of the authorities bond here, page 342 of the judgment at about F, Lord Lloyd said, with regret, however, I cannot agree with the Court of Appeal on the second question. It's the second question that I just explained to your Lordships and your Ladyship. There would seem to be no reason why the relevant words in section 24.2, no arrears of interest shall be recovered, should not be given their ordinary meaning so as to bar execution after six years in respect of all judgments. It is what the words say. Recovered has a broad meaning. It is not confined to recovery by a fresh action. Then goes on to describe what the Court of Appeal held, that the limitation to six years interest on judgments applies only in a case of action on judgments. And then just above H, but in my view, this does not follow as a matter of language. Any judgment in the first half of the sentence means quite literally any judgment. There's no warrant for limiting interest in respect of any judgment debt in the second half of the sentence to interest in respect of a judgment in an action on a judgment, even if one could think of any good reason why Parliament should so have provided. Over the page, a little bit below B, um, before I say that, I should just note in passing that at A, um, Lord Lloyd does not say firmly that the legislative history ought to have been considered in that case, but simply proceeds on the basis that it may have been relevant. It's not relevant to the particular point we're looking at now. A little bit below B, so as to the second question, I prefer the decision of Tucky, Mr. Justice Tucky, who held that section 24.2 limits recovery by way of execution on all judgments to a period of six years, including the judgment in this case. This makes it necessary to consider a third question, the section 32 question. So 
that final passage I've just read out obviously must be read in light of what Lord Lloyd said in the page before. Unfortunately, we don't have, or there doesn't appear to be available, a copy of, Lord, of Mr Justice Tucky's decision, though um, we have on this side of the table looked for it. Um, but nonetheless, um, the facts of the case in Lousley make clear why the gloss that Lord Lloyd adds about six years of interest in referring to the way in which Section 24.2 operates, why the significance of that for, for Lord Lloyd. Your Lordships, your Ladyship will have seen that Lousley and Forbes concerned a judgment entered by consent. In other words, a judgment in which the liability was incurred on the same date as the liability was payable. So there was no issue in question as to what became due meant. There was no need even for the courts to consider that. Um, as a result, in addition to reading the passage at page 217 of the authorities bundle I've just quoted in light of the page before, it's important to understand, obviously, that this not being issue in this case meant that uh, a reference to six years of interest reflected the factual position in the case. Again, that conceptual distinction between what the meaning of the statute is and its application to the present case. So Lord Lloyd's description was perfectly accurate in the application of section 24.2 to the facts before him. Uh, that's the first part of the first part of my submission, so to speak. I want to move to say uh, something about the approach that Mrs Justice Diaz took and why we say she fell into error in relation to that. Um, if you could pick up the core bundle, starting at page 7. And page 73 um, is where the, the judgment proper begins. Now, instead of beginning with a consideration of the statute, its context, where the provision in section 24.2 appears, um, Mrs Justice Diaz took a different approach. She identified the question that she was required to determine at paragraph 2. The question is whether section 24.2 operates to limit recovery of interest where the period between the date of the cost order and the date of the assessment is greater than six years. Um, no doubt a slightly abbreviated way of identifying it, but nonetheless one that collapsed that conceptual distinction um, that I referred to before. There were two separate issues. One, what became due meant in section 24.2, quite separate to any application to this case. And secondly, having determined what that meaning was, how it would be applied um, into the particular factual circumstances before the judge. Now, obviously, there is some interaction between those two phases. If a particular meaning, having been ascertained, produces absurd or odd results, plainly it's incumbent on a judge to then reconsider the construction to determine whether that construction should indeed be adopted. But they are nonetheless conceptually distinct. Um, over the page twice to paragraph 11, page 75. Mrs Justice Diaz then considered the words, as she says, in their statutory context. She began by noting my submission to her that became due means became payable, um, and then introduced her own conceptual distinction between the amount being due and the amount being payable, um, and went on to support that conceptual distinction by reference to time charter parties, an area in which she's no doubt expert and has written the chapter um, in Carver on charter parties. Um, she then reinforced that analogy by reference to it being counterintuitive, I'm now on page 76, to accept that interest accrues day by day from the date of the order, yet at the same time argue that nothing is in fact due until some uncertain future date. If the judgment debtor made payment before execution, it could not conceivably be denied that he had extinguished liability for something which was otherwise due. Those considerations lead powerful support to the submission of my little friend that on the plain and ordinary meaning of the words, a sum becomes due when the liability crystallizes. There are at least three errors built within to, into that paragraph, we say. 
First, the judge focused on the word due outside of even the context of its own clause, let alone the subsection itself. In doing so, she introduced without any contextual or textual support this idea that there was a distinction between due and payable. I entirely accept that in certain contracts, including time charter parties, that conceptual distinction has been held to exist and may be appropriate to delimit. Um, but it required justification, given the points that I've taken your ladyship and your lordship through already, as to why that conceptual distinction formed part of subsection two of subsection 24. And the learned judge gave no justification for, for introducing that. Um, in addition, uh, the suggestion that it was counterintuitive for interest to accrue, but nothing to be due, also compounded that error um, and uh, overlooked the way in which interest may be calculated or accrue in that sense, but nonetheless be payable and therefore due at another date. There was nothing counterintuitive about that and certainly nothing counterintuitive based on the legislation itself. And then finally, and I've already taken your ladyship and your lordship through these points, um, the failure to read section 24 in the context of the act as a whole and the other provisions within the same part um, also was, we say, an error. In paragraph um, 13, 14, and 16, the judge then um, engaged in a further erroneous reasoning process by um, wrongly concluding that section 24.2 was only applicable to enforcement and was therefore of a different sort to the time limits that were provided in other parts of the Act. Now, that is a misreading of Lousley and Forbes, which as I understand it is not under challenge by my learned friend. But we say that that was a fundamental misunderstanding that then led, as I'll go on to show a little later, um, the judge to disregard Walters and also to overlook the presumption that the same phrase when used in the same act ought to be given the same meaning. Um, paragraph 16 um, and 17, or at least 16, is where that aspect of the judge's analysis of the ordinary and natural meaning of the section concludes. But she picks it up again at paragraph 36, having considered the legislative history. Now, I'll come back to the legislative history point because I think it deserves separate treatment. But at paragraph 36, she confirmed um, that the plain and ordinary meaning of due was not when it becomes payable um, and repeated the issue that section 24 um, two and subsection one of the same section refer to different parts um, of the process, one, versus, one purely focused on enforcement and the other um, in relation to both enforcement and the claim itself. So for, for those reasons, um, we say that the ordinary natural meaning of the statute, simply looking at the text um, and considering the interpretation that's been given to other provisions that require a congruent construction with section 24 uh, meant that became due in section 24.2 ought to have been held to mean became payable. Can I turn then to the second part of my submissions in relation to Walters and Toft? Just before you do so, yes. um, Mrs. Justice Dias at, at 36 makes the, draws support from the distinction between due in 24.1 and enforceable, sorry, due in 24.2 and enforceable in, in 24.1. Yes, she's already made that point earlier, paragraph 13. Yes. What, what do you say about that distinction? Um, we say that it reflects the nature of the claim that is being made. So in relation to a judgment, one might have used the same word payable to refer to enforceable, or it could have been used interchangeably in that sense. But enforceable was used because obviously when one considers when a judgment can be 
acted on in some way, either by claim or enforcement, one refers to enforceability. It would not make sense to refer to interest being enforceable as a matter of plain English and the way that we understand the way in which interest arises. Interest accrues and becomes payable. And the reference to became due is a reference to became payable. Um, so we, we say that there is no other interpretive significance that should operate in relation to that, and certainly not a conclusion that the failure to use enforceable in subsection 2 means that due or became due holds a meaning other than its ordinary and natural meaning. Moving then to Walters and Toft, if I may. <clears throat> I've addressed Walters and what the decision was um, in Walters. Can I briefly touch on Toft and then move to explain the way in which the judge considered Walters and Toft and the reasons why she considered they weren't binding on her or why we say they're wrong. Um, Toft is an odd and perhaps typically chancery case. Um, it's behind tab 12 and also behind tab 9. Now, the reason why we've included both is because the facts only appear in the report behind tab 9, an earlier instance. Um, given that they are somewhat involved and expressed in typically 19th century turgid fashion, um, it may be helpful if I just briefly go through what we say those relevant facts are and why the case is important. Um, the facts appear at page 72 to 73 of the authorities' bundle. This is in the 1851 decision and report. So on the 4th of March in 1811, Mr. Maris entered into an agreement with a Mr. Stevenson to purchase freehold land. The purchase price was paid on the 13th of May, 1811, so that's nine days later. But Mr. Stevenson was let in immediately to possession of the land, even though the purchase price um, had not been paid. Yeah, you said the purchase price paid. It was, it was to be paid. To be paid. Yes, it forgive me. It wasn't in fact paid. Correct, that yes, was, which is was, a key point. That was the whole point of the action. Indeed, yes, yes. It was to be paid nine days later, but wasn't paid. Correct. Um, Mr. Maris was made bankrupt in 1812, and Mr. Stevenson then died in 1827, without title having been paid, and also without the purchase price having been paid. And it took another 20 years for the point to come to a head, um, at which point Mr. Maris's trustees in bankruptcy claimed a lien um, over the freehold land um, to secure the purchase price, which at that point still remain unpaid. Uh, those who claimed title through Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson having died, ran precisely the argument that Mr. Vick ran below. And you can see that from um, the report behind tab 12 at page 86 of the authorities' bundle, and about a quarter of the way down the page. So although the court has held that the statute of limitations has not run as regards the principle of the purchase money, interest cannot be recovered for more than six years. Here, the purchase money became due on the 30th of May, which I think is a, a typo, perhaps. The day fixed by the contract for sale, contract of sale for payment, but for the acknowledgement, it goes on, the interest became due day by day, and consequently no more than six years can be recovered. So the precise issue that Mrs. Justice Diaz faced and that this court faces in relation to what became due means was squarely raised um, by those who claimed through Mr. Stevenson. The court unanimously rejected that argument. Um, Lord Justice Turner gave the the only really reasoned judgment with which Lord Justice Knight Bruce um, agreed. Picking that up at the bottom of page 86, I just might invite your ladyship and your lordship to read from the final paragraph there um, until the penultimate paragraph on page 87. Certainly. 
although expressed in rather um, concise language, that final paragraph or the penultimate paragraph of, of the judgment quite clearly holds that became due in section 42 of the 1833 Act means became payable. In the present case... As, as I read the judgment, uh, it is the, the principal didn't become due in 1811 because there wasn't a conveyance. And as one sees from the, the penultimate paragraph, the interest couldn't be due until the principal money became payable. Now, that there's no distinction being drawn between accrual and ability to enforce in that. The interest wasn't due, it, wasn't, it hadn't accrued, and it hadn't become payable because the principal hadn't accrued or become payable. So it wasn't a case in which there was any distinction being drawn between a time at which something had accrued and a time at which it became Payable. The simple answer to the argument, which is being given here, as I understand it, is interest interest wasn't accrued or payable in, in 1811 mm. because um, the, the purchase price wasn't due to be paid or accrued to be paid at that stage. Yes. Uh, so so it, it's, it's, not, it's not a case on the distinction that arises in... in, in in our case, is it? We say it is for, for this reason. Um, and it brings up one of the important aspects of the difficulty with language in relation to this particular provision. So I want to be quite careful as to how I express myself in relation to that. I think it would be said that the liability to pay the purchase price has been incurred or had been incurred by this point. Um, but I, I, I think what, what, it, what is being said, isn't it? Um, by Lord Justice Turner, is you, you, you don't become entitled to it if there isn't a conveyance. If one looks at, at ten lines up at the bottom, page 86 of the bundle, the money didn't become payable on the 30th of May. The right would accrue upon the title being perfected by evidence. And then the right, the suit seeks a right consequent and dependent upon the specific performance of the original agreement. It couldn't be paid unless the contract were completed. Isn't that the point that's being made? That if the contract it was completed, there would be then the obligation to make payment. When? When it was completed, i.e. from the moment of conveyance. Correct. Which, had no, which, which, which hadn't occurred in 1811. Correct. If Mrs. Justice Diaz's construction were applied in this case, then the incurrence of the obligation, although conditional on a conveyance, would mark the point at which the liability had been incurred. But, but that isn't that isn't what's what's being said here. It isn't being said there was that there was a debt which had accrued uh, at the time for completion in this case. It says if you don't have completion, the debt doesn't accrue because it's not the concomitant of specific performance of the conveyance. We would say that the right to have the, the debt would not be payable until that conveyance had, had arisen, that there was a liability that had been incurred, although it was of a conditional nature. Well, you might say that, but is, where do you see that that's Lord Justice Turner's reasoning? Uh, well, it seems to be the opposite. I'm not sure that I can push it any further than that, but, but that is the way that we, we take... Um, what about the last Stevenson. sentence of the judgment? What does that mean? Yes, uh, I, I, I'm grateful, my lord. I, I think the final sentence is, is quite important in that respect, um, because... It suggests that interest has accrued or continues to accrue in quite the same way that it would under a, a cost subject to a cost order subject to detailed assessment. Um, in other words, the accrual has occurred um, even from the date of the contract, although it doesn't become payable until some point later. But so it can't have accrued at the date of the contract, can it? One is always looking much later down the track as to when it's accrued or deemed to have accrued. 
but in, this maybe case, in this case, there's a contract for sale. There's a price to be paid at a later date. Yes. Uh, at best, interest could only accrue on the price at the at the later date, not at the date of the contract, could it? I mean, the reference to the completion of the contract is slightly curious, isn't it? But you say that means um, performance of the contract. Yes. So we say two things about it. First, that the distinction between payable and accrual is clearly um, in Lord Justice Turner's mind um, in explaining what became due means. Um, and secondly, that um, accrual of the interest was from the, as, as he says, the inception of the contract, meaning the date on which the contract was entered into. Now, maybe that there's an infelicity of expression in relation to that, and what he intended to mean was the date on which, under the contract, the parties had agreed that the purchase price would be paid. But the action of specific, or the, the bill for specific performance, um, uh, or I should say the action for the debt, did not lie until a conveyance had been um, brought, had been made, um, on the basis that there was a conditionality built into the liability that had been incurred. But nonetheless, the liability to pay interest had been incurred, and the relevant date by which it became due is to be measured is the date by which that interest was to be payable. And the fact that aligns with the principle in this case was a matter of the application of that meaning to the facts of the case. Anyway, the view seems to have been taken in this 19th century chancery case that um, litigation commenced decades after the relevant contract at a time when everybody was dead was premature. Yes, <laughs> indeed. And helpful, no doubt, for counsel involved. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to turn to the way in which the judge dealt with um, Walters and Toft. Um, and that begins at paragraph 44. In relation to Walters, um, I should say that she dealt with each of these authorities quite briefly and at the very end of her judgment. Um, in relation to Walters, she held that it wasn't binding on her for two reasons. The first was that it was decided per incurium. That's at paragraph 45. And although she doesn't express it in those terms, she did confirm you know, the consequentials um, hearing that that was what she had meant. And the bundle reference to that is the supplementary bundle, tab 10 at page 128. As I understand it, Mr. Vic on this appeal does not challenge um, that being an incorrect basis upon which to hold that um, Walters was not binding on her. Uh, and indeed, Walters would be binding on this court as well. The second reason that the judge gave for not following or applying Walters was that it related to a different section of the 1980 Act. Um, now, if we go back to paragraph 16 of her judgment, which is at page 76 of the bundle. She had concluded there that the other provisions of the Act were directed to the bringing of claims, but sub subsection two of section 24 was directed at enforcement. And that was then picked up at paragraph 45 of her judgment on page 81 as the reason why she wasn't going to follow or didn't feel bound by Walters. Also a decision on a different section of the Act and with all due diffidence, I think that made any difference. Um, that I do not regard it as binding me to find in Mr. McLeod's favour on this case. Um, we say there are two errors within that. First, the error I've already taken your ladyship and your lordships through the misunderstanding of the application of section 24.2 in relation to enforcement. And the second is the 
disregard or failure to apply the presumption that the same words in the same act are presumed to have the same meaning. The judge did not apply that presumption, nor did she identify any reason why that presumption ought not to be applicable here. And we say it plainly should be applicable here. As to Toft, her basis for not following or applying it um, is not the, the reason that my Lord, Lord Justice Popper had given me, but rather that it concerned a very different factual scenario. As I say, Toft is authority for what the meaning of became due is in section 42 of the 1833. The fact that it arose in different factual circumstances would not be a reason to distinguish it. Um, is is um, Walters cited anywhere, or um, does it appear in any textbooks, or has it just um, disappeared until you found it for this uh, case? It is. It, it does appear in uh, one of the 1980s editions of the limitation textbooks that uh, are no longer in print. Um, up to about the middle of the 1980s. There are about four, as no doubt your ladyship and your lordships would be familiar. There are at least four limitation textbooks that were in regular publication. I, I can find out over the lunch break which one it's referred to in, but that is the only one that it's referred to in, but for the proposition that I cite it for. Otherwise, I'm not aware of any other case apart from the first instance decision in this one where it's been cited. Um, but th then again, it appears that um, no one has had the ingenuity apart from Mr. Vic to raise the point um, in relation to became due um, or for there to have been a detailed assessment in which the point might have arisen or been taken. Or his inspired legal advisors. <laughs> <laughs> I would include that <laughs> within uh, the, the, the denotation. Um, my, my learned friend relies on some additional reasons to support um, Mrs. Justice DS not finding that Toft and Walters uh, were binding on her, and that's at his skeleton beginning at paragraph 41, which is behind tab four of the core bundle. I'm not proposing to take the relationship or relationships to that, but just for your note, page 57 behind tab four. Um, on receipt of that skeleton argument, we took the view that the rules on respondents' notices are quite clear um, and wrote in November last year to um, Mr. Vick's solicitors, indicating that we thought one was required. Um, no notice has since been filed in relation to that. No doubt my learned friend will address you on that point. It may be that I need to say something in reply on it. It may indeed be considered by the court as a sterile point, but nonetheless, um, I may say something in reply, but I don't propose to go any further at this stage. Unless there are any further questions in relation to Walters or Toft, um, I propose to move then. Paragraph 41. Yes. Is this, is this the main skeleton or the, the, the main skeleton, yes. This is Rockley's Bank and Walters. Uh, sorry, it's paragraph 41 at page 57. Under the heading, the case is relied upon by Gibbard. Yes. And so at paragraph 43 and paragraph 47, so you're saying they're not, not entitled to raise these questions about how the authority is to be interpreted without a respondent's notice? Well, we say that the basis upon which um, those those reasons are given are in our con concern um, the those cases being ones concerning contracts as opposed to um, a, interest on a judgment. Um, they're not reasons that the judge relied upon to distinguish or otherwise not follow um, Toft and Walters. Um, as we say, uh, mindful of a number of recent Court of Appeal authorities being quite strict about respondents' notices, um, we identified that as a point. For our part, it's a matter between the Court and Mr Vick um, as to 
what one should do about that. I simply raise it now, and as I say, my learned friend may have something to say about it. The court will no doubt have a view on it, um, and it may well be a sterile point. I don't take it any further than that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, where have we got to? Yes, so the, the third part of my submission is where we're up to the legislative history. Um, and we have read the skeleton arguments, obviously. Quite, yes. Um, I, I wanted to deal with two points. The first, the legitimacy of referring to legislative history in construing subsection, subsection 2, and secondly, um, briefly addressing the legislative history and why it supports um, our construction. Um, the court will have seen and read supplementary skeleton arguments. The short point that we say is the effect of the Supreme Court decision in Canada Square is that in relation to the 1980 Act, because it's a consolidation act, um, it's not legitimate to refer to its legislative history um, unless there is some ambiguity or some serious or substantial question um, or difficulty in the interpretation of a section that cannot be resolved by ordinary canons of construction. Because our primary case here, as below, is that the words of section 24.2 are clear and their ordinary natural meaning is clear, there's no basis, it's neither necessary nor legitimate to refer to the legislative history. Um, but we say even if it were legitimate, that legislative history supports us um, in relation to that. Um, can I just briefly go through the legislative provisions to trace through the way in which section 24.2 um, came up uh, and, uh, and then move swiftly along from there? Uh, the 1833 Act is the first one, and that's behind tab one of the first volume of the authority on that. Section 42 appears on page 10 behind that tab. And about five lines down from the top is where the relevant phrase, but within six years next after the same respectively shall have become due. Referencing there, payments of sums of money secured by land, or rent, respect of any legacy, or damages in respect of such arrears. As your ladyship and your lordships will have noted from the skeleton arguments, no judgment debts were referenced there, but by judicial, shall we say, creativity, um, that was read back into section 42 um, at a later date in the case of Henry and Smith. Um, there was no repeal or amendment of that provision until the 1939 Consolidation Act. Um, preceding the Consolidation Act was the 1936 report of the Law Revision Committee, which is behind tab 33 of volume two. So perhaps if we were to keep the 1833 open, then we'll move back to the 1939 Act. Page 442 of that authority's bundle is the consideration given to arrears of interest and recovery of that in section 42. It's apparent from the third and fourth paragraphs there was no substantive consideration of the meaning of the provision. And I place emphasis, as I did in construing section 24.2, on the reference to arrears of interest and arrears of rent. The committee decided there was no reason to alter any of the above provisions. That takes us to the 1939 Act, which is behind tab four in volume one. 
42 was distributed in, in its different applications across different provisions of the 1939 Act. In its application to interest on judgment debts, it appeared in subsection 4 of section 2, which is on page 23 of the authorities. Mm -hmm. Going back to a question that was put to me earlier about the relevance of enforceable in section 24, if one were to consider the legislative history, um, it may be relevant to take account of the fact that section 24, 1 and 2 were included in the same provision in section 2, 4, where there was a reference first to the judgment being enforceable, and then after a comma and no arrears of interest in respect of any judgment debt being recovered and referencing became due there. It would be odd in that provision, we say, for enforceable to appear twice. I'm not proposing to take you to the other provisions that apply in section 42, but just for your note, it's section 17, which is at page 29 of the authorities bundle, section 18, subsection five, which is at page 30 of the authorities bundle, and section 20, which is at page 31 of the authorities bundle. Sorry, could you just give me those again? Sections? Section 17, which concerns rent arrears, that's at page 29. Section 18, subsection 5, which concerns interest arrears for a sum secured by a mortgage or other charge, that's at page 30. And section 20, which concerns legacies, at page 31. In my skeleton argument, um, there is also uh, the legislative history is tracked through um, and the way in which those provisions in the 1939 um, are replaced um, is dealt with at paragraph 14 of my skeleton argument. That brings us then to the 1980 Act, which I've already taken your ladyship and your lordships through. Preceding the 1980 Act was a 1976 report of the Law Reform Committee. And that's in volume two again, behind tab 34. Page 450 of the authorities bundle, beginning at paragraph 4.12. That constitutes the only consideration of section 2.4 of the 1939 Act. We place reference, or we place weight on that the final clause of the first sentence. Only six a year's arrears of interest due on a judgment may be recovered. Again, the point about arrears that the interest must have become payable in order for arrears to have arisen. So we say it's entirely consistent with our construction. Now, my learned friend relies on uh, a swathe of 19th century authority uh, to suggest that there was some basis for suggesting there was a statutory cap um, that was imposed in relation to interest on a judgment. Uh, I may say something in reply in relation to that. I'm not proposing <coughs> to take your ladyship or your lordships through that. But we say those cases don't support the construction, that any references to six years of interest are glosses that make sense in the particular facts of those cases, but don't in fact consider the words that are in issue here, the date on which the interest became due. Isn't there a statutory cap of six years' worth of interest on both of your interpretations, the issue being when the six years starts running? I think, so I, I would say yes, but um, in relation to that question. The reason for that is I think the concept of the cap as adopted by the judge below was that it operated retrospectively. Um, so, in other words, you track back from the date 
um, that you're looking at or seeking to enforce, you get six years back from that. Now, that may be the way that the section applies in circumstances where you have um, the same date that liability to pay and incurrence occurs. In the ordinary case of, say, a judgment um, for damages, which is immediately payable, and perhaps the claimant waits 10 years before seeking to um, recover that interest, whether by way of an action or a judgment or by way of enforcement. At that point, in effect, the calculation would be taken from the date the claim form is issued back six years. Although, if one were taking the more cumbersome approach to the operation of the section, one would say interest has first fallen due, that is payable, on the day of the judgment being entered, and thereafter an amount of interest accrued and became payable each day, so that once you look at when the interest became due, that in effect means you only look back six years. But what we say is that looking back six years retrospectively, um, and that's what the judge below seemed to think the cap contemplated, um, is not the correct approach to it, which is why I say yes, but. So in other words, you are limited to six years, but six years from the date, we say, on which the interest became payable. Thank I hope you. that answers your Lordship's question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> that was all I proposed to say in relation to legislative history. Um, the final part of my submissions um, relate to the final two paragraphs of the grounds of appeal. Um, I could just invite your ladyship and your lordships to pull that off. Um, paragraph five on page. Just before you do that, yes. um, part of the, the legislative history and the, and the Lamb and Ryder part of it and so on um, had to consider the fact that under the rules of the Supreme Court, as originally introduced in 1875, and I think at all times up until uh, 1999, had a provision that for execution of judgments, you had to get leave if they were more than six years old. Is there any equivalent in the CPR? Yes, I, I don't have the particular provision to hand, but um, if one seeks to enforce a judgment after six years, one needs leave um, or apply to leave to, to, to do so. Um, I think... Perhaps you, could, perhaps you could find that for me at some stage. Yes. Thank you. Um, the... The, the, the point that I would make about that too is your Lordship will have seen that we've reserved our position in relation to the correctness of Lousley and Forbes, principally in relation to, to that point. Um, so the question of um, the separation of enforcement and action on a judgment. Um, but we say that procedure that existed until 1999 and continues um, in a similar form does not have a bearing um, on the meaning of became due in subsection two. I'm not quite sure I understand by reserved your position. Um, uh, well, I, I, I can't challenge Lousley and Forbes in this court. Um, and, right. and, and below, uh, a lot of weight was placed on the fact that Lousley and Forbes, in effect, compelled the present decision because of the way it applied differently in section, subsection one and subsection two. Um, so I simply re reserve my position in order, if it goes further, um, I have that yeah, yes, possibility. But, but in order, therefore, to say that subsection 1 means all forms of execution, not simply action on the judgment. That, that, you say, is the right interpretation of section 24.1. Well, I understood you correctly. Uh, no. What, so what the effect of Lousley and Forbes is, is that subsection 1 applies only to action or a judgment, not enforcement, and subsection 2 applies to both. Uh, you want to say subsection 2 applies only to an action or a judgment? Correct. I see. Sorry, I'm just being slow. Thank you. Yes. Um, and given that the interpretation of what Lousley holds in relation to subsection 2 has been an issue here, and in particular whether it decides the question about became due, um, it was for that reason that we've reserved our position consistently below and now here. Thank you. Um, I, I was about to turn to the grounds of appeal behind tab two, <coughs> page 18 and 19, paragraph five and six. 
Um, I don't propose to spend very much time on this at all. But in the alternative, if your ladyship and your lordships are nonetheless persuaded, despite my best efforts, that Mrs Justice Stevens was correct in her construction, we nonetheless say that she applied that construction incorrectly, very much as an alternative to our primary submission. Um, for the purposes of that, I need to get into a little bit of the orders that were made below that um, the interest accrued under. I'll go through those quickly. We're in the supplementary bundle. Beginning at tab one. Page three of that. Uh, what um, Mrs. Justice Diaz held was that interest became due for the purposes of section 24.2 on the date that this order was made that is before your ladyship and your lordships. Um, this order was made at the conclusion of the trial of the action. Paragraph three and four required Sebastian Holdings Inc., the defendant, the unsuccessful defendant, um, to pay banks costs. Um, 85% assessed at the indemnity basis, but subject to detail assessment. Um, behind tab two, on the 2nd of July, 2014, so that's some nine months after the first order, which was in November, 2013, Mr. Justice Cook made a non-party cost order In paragraph one, which is on page six, required Mr. Vick, who'd been joined to the proceedings by an order dated the 3rd of December, which is not in the bundle, um, for the purposes of costs only. He was required to pay the sum of 36 million pounds or thereabouts. Now that represented the interim payment that Sebastian Holdings had been ordered to pay, plus the interest that had accrued up to the date of this order. Um, this order didn't fully implement what Mr Justice Cook's judgment had indicated. I'll just give you the reference to that, which is his judgment is um, supplementary bundle tab 6, page 44, at 103, par paragraph 103, where he had concluded that Mr Vick should be responsible for all of the costs um, to be paid by Sebastian Holdings. In other words, he should pay the costs that were awarded to Deutsche Bank. But the order, for reasons that I can't elaborate on because I wasn't involved at the time, um, that wasn't reflected in that order. Um, as a result of that, behind tab three, a further order was made, the restoration of the original non-party cost application by Deutsche Bank. This was made on paper. Paragraph one, page 12, clarified that Mr. Vick was required to pay Deutsche Bank's costs under paragraph three and four of the original order plus interest accrued thereon. That was the 10th of October, 2016. <clears throat> Mrs. Justice Diaz did not give much consideration, it appears in her judgment, to when or why um, any of the dates of those orders that I've just taken your ladyship and your lordship through should be applicable. Um, but if we pick up the judgment, this is core behind tab seven, paragraph eight, which is page 74. <clears throat> she summarized the point at issue And referred to it being whether interest on costs under the 8th of November 2013 order first became due and then summarized my position which was that it was only payable after the final cost certificate and Mr Morris's position which is that it first became due on the date of the original order. Now that was then picked up paragraph 47 page 82 of the bundle. For all those reasons, 
I conclude where the costs are ordered to be assessed, interest becomes due within the meaning of section 24.2 on the date of the original order and accrues from day to day thereafter. And that was then reflected in her order, which is behind tab six, paragraph one at page 70, the declaration that was made referencing the 8th of November order. We say that even on her own construction, which is that interest became due at the point that the liability was incurred, that is an odd and absurd result. Was this an argument that you advanced below? Uh, it, it wasn't, no. Um, so I'm not surprised she didn't deal with it. Uh, there wasn't, in fact, an opportunity um, to, to, to deal with, with that point. Although that she described um, Mr. Morris's position as being the original order was the date on which that should operate, um, that we that was not a point that had been identified until um, the hearing itself um, of the of, of the, the referral. Um, and so because of the unusual circumstances in the way that this referral was made, we had suggested that Mr. Vic um, agree to a sequential exchange of skeleton arguments or positions, there being no application notice or other indication as to what the position was going to be taken. Um, when that didn't happen, um, we exchanged, uh, or we exchanged rather than serving sequentially. Um, and so during the course of the hearing, it wasn't apparent um, the way in which uh, the construction that the judge would adopt would apply. And for that reason, that's the reason why the, the argument wasn't considered or dealt with. So I misunderstood. I, I mean, I thought that the dispute, um, which I thought was the dispute that's always been the same dispute, arose during the course of the assessment and that the senior cost judge referred it to the High Court for decision. And that that, that dispute had been identified as one, as the weather, uh, the six-year cutoff, Yes. Ran from date of accrual. If I, if I misunderstood that. Uh, it's correct that that's when the dispute first arose, but can I just take you to the letter that identified it, which is in the bundle, which is behind tab 11 of the supplementary bundle. <clears throat> so the way the case was put, as set out there in a letter from Mr. Vick's solicitors, was simply that Deutsche Bank was only entitled to six years of interest. So six years calculated back from the date on which the claim was made. There's no position taken as to what date on which the interest became due was, was um, or should, should be, what meaning that should be given to that. It was simply that you have a statutory cap of six years. And paragraph four identifies, therefore, what the monetary consequences in relation to the date. So Correct. This would be reasonably apparent from that what the date, what, what the date was that they were contending for. No, um, not in fact, because <coughs> recall 2013 was when the first cost order was made. This was now 10 years after that. And um, in fact, the, the relevant costs that, that are an issue for um, before the or oh, sorry, the relevant interest that's an issue for before the 2016 um, order. So my point is, because of the way in which the constructions of the parties passed in the night, we saying that you calculated prospectively from the date on which interest became payable, and Mr. Vick's construction being that it was a retrospective statutory cap, where in effect it didn't matter what date you took as the date that it became due. Instead, you took it simply from the date that you claimed and worked back six years. We had no clarity as to what the date on which interest became due would be from the other side. I found that slightly surprising on the, on the numbers. It's the difference between um, if, it, if it runs from the non-party cost order in 2016, then you, you hardly lose any interest on your six years. If it goes back to 2013, you lose about three and a half years worth, which is about three quarters of a million pounds. I would well, have thought that so in, in you fact, might have focused on what the consequence was in financial terms. Is the yes, the disputed interest, about I think 400,000 pounds of it, um, is from in fact pre judgment interest that was awarded. Um, and so it wasn't a straightforward calculation that was being made that could identify that simply from reference to that table. 
um, I should say I wasn't instructed in relation to the detailed assessment procedure, so um, I, I can't speak to um, the way in which that was clarified or not clarified. Anyway, um, you, you're, you're telling us you, 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 you at least hadn't appreciated until the course of the hearing that uh, it was being said uh, in 2013 rather than 2016. And it wasn't even clear unambiguously in the course of the hearing as to which date it was going to be fixed on. The, the terms, the original order, um, were ones that appeared in the judge's judgment for the first time. Um, and it was on the basis of that judgment then that the order was settled um, and made by reference to the 8th of November 2013 order. Thank you. In any event, the short point that, that we say is that if that construction is right, then the date on which the, the, the interest could possibly earliest, the earliest that it could have become due, was when Mr Vick was made liable for those costs by the 10th of October, Order 2016, the one that clarified that he was, in fact, liable. Um, and so interest became due on the judge's construction at that point um, and not earlier. I understand that's your submission. Why is, why is that right? Uh, do you, do, does, I mean, the distinction seems to be between due, meaning due to the judgment creditor, which is the case against you, or meaning due from the particular person against whom it is ultimately seeking to be enforced, which may change from time to time. And you say it's the latter. Yes, I say it's the latter because wow. the judgment that's being enforced or the, the interest judgment debt is the, the, the judgment debt created by the order against Mr Vick. Until that point, there's no judgment debt against Mr Vick. And so therefore, for interest to accrue and become due, there needs to be a judgment debt against the party from whom interest is sought to be recovered. That's consistent with the policy of time limits and limitation periods in the Act, because the purpose of time limits is for time to start running after the party who is seeking to recover something or make a claim is able to take action. Until the order was made on the 10th of October, there was no judgment debt, no interest, therefore, that Deutsche Bank could have recovered against Mr Vick. Mr Vick would have quite rightly said prior to that point, I'm not paying any interest, I'm not paying any judgment debt, there's no order against me. And that arises, you say, from the wording of 24.2 which is no arrears of interest in respect of any judgment debt shall be recovered. Correct. So it fi there is a fix... ...by the particular judgment debt yes. in respect of which there is sought to be a recovery of interest. Precisely. In this case, that's the non-party cost order in 2016. Exactly. No problem, thank you. Those are my submissions, unless I can assist you further. Thank you very much, that's most helpful. Yes, Mr. Morris. Good morning, well, good morning. Uh, <coughs> well, as my lady, <coughs> you might have picked up from the skeleton argument that an order for costs to be assessed has been described in the House of Lords as an anomaly. Um, and this case, it seems, is an anomalous anomaly, because by my reckoning, this is day 102 of the cost assessment, which has itself taken over six years. And the judge was very much alive to the fact below that hard cases make bad law. Um, and uh, this appeal arises out of an attempt to apply a statute to an exceptional situation. And essentially, when you stand back, what the bank is saying is that it is entitled this point to the last 10 years worth of interest on a judgment debt and there appears to have been no case that either of us have been able to find uh, where that has been allowed to happen. So having made those introductory remarks I propose to take things in the following order. Uh, first of all I'm going to analyse the statutory language as my friend did. Um, secondly I'll look at the authorities on which the bank relies. Thirdly I'll turn to analyse the underlying policy 
and the mischief uh, at which the statute is aimed. Um, fourthly, come on and look at the statutory history and its relevance. Fifthly, I'll address the bank submissions on the adverse, or as it puts it, absurd consequences that flow from the judge's conclusion. Um, and finally, I'll address the argument that my learned friend took last, that in any event, the judge misapplied her own construction in the declaration that she made. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I start with some uncontroversial propositions, um, and I anchor those in Hunt's case, which is a decision of the House of Lords, uh, which is the important decision which settles forever uh, the tension between those who argue that interests on costs should run from the date of the order, uh, the Alicata rule, and those who argued that it should be, sorry, the Incipita rule, and those who argued that it should run from the date of the final certificate. Uh, now, we haven't looked at that yet, um, and it's in volume one of the authorities bundle, uh, and it's behind uh, tab 17. My lords, my lady, if you turn to the conclusion on page 168. Down at E, under the heading conclusion, this is the speech of Lord Ackner, who also gave the speech in the next case, the Thomas and Bunn decision. Uh, you will see from about so the way through that paragraph, I respectfully agree <clears throat> with the observations of the Court of Appeal. Uh, and I invite you, my lady, my lords, just to read down to the end of um, B on the next page, on page 169. Certainly. So my laws, my lady, <clears throat> what we see here is the justification for this anomalous situation that an order for costs to be assessed is treated as a judgment debt, even though the amount of the principal gets quantified in the future. And just before we leave this case, you'll see at C, Lord Ackner addressed a submission that uh, a judgment uh, that an order for costs to be taxed couldn't be a judgment debt because there was no sum for which execution could be levied. Uh, and uh, at D, if you just note what Lord Ackner said about that, because that's relevant to the next case that we'll look at. But what this decision establishes is that an order for cost to be assessed is a judgment debt for the purposes of the Judgments Act. It carries interest from the date on which it is pronounced. So in other words, from that point, there is a liability to pay interest. And in my submission, it's important to approach the statutory language through the right conceptual lens. Um, and I'd just like, before I do that, to look at the next decision, which is Thomas and Bunn, another decision of the House of Lords. Uh, and again, Lord Acker's speech, which is uh, the relevant part, page 187, down at the bottom. Uh, H. But shortly, the respondents argue that since it is accepted on all sides that Hunt's case establishes and rightly establishes that the liability 
to pay interest on costs does not have to await quantification of those costs, but dates back to the date of the judgment awarding those costs, the principle should apply to damages that were submitted if quantification is not necessary for the completion of the obligation to pay costs, the same principle should apply to damages. Uh, and then, <clears throat> my Lord's my lady, down at E, Lord Ackner turns back to his speech in Hunt's case, and this is where he uses the word anomaly. I accept that it is an anomaly, that an order for payment of costs to be taxed is construed for the purpose of Section 17 as a judgment debt, which though before taxation has been completed, there is no sum for which execution can be levied. He then explains that the courts have accepted that uh, for so long, and as he explained in Hunt's case, the balance of justice favours continuing so to treat such an order. But then uh, you will uh, note, my lords, over the page, and, and my lady, I'm sorry, page 189, down at F, the issue for him to decide there was whether an order for damages to be assessed was a judgment debt for the purposes of the Act. Uh, and uh, he departed from what he'd said, Obiter, in Hunt's case, uh, and at F, made clear that in the case of damages to be assessed, it is the final order pronouncing the quantum, which is the judgment debt. And there are just some important policy observations that his lordship makes in the context of an order for something to be taxed. They start down at the bottom of the page on 189. It says that the objections that were raised did, however, emphasise the obvious. viz., that over on page 190, reasonable effort shall be made to achieve with the minimum delay the final determination of all the issues in such litigation if plaintiffs were not to lose substantial sums by way of interest, which could be earned on the fruits of such litigation. In cases where liability is not seriously in issue, as indeed was the case in all these three appeals, then if for one reason or another finality cannot be achieved expeditiously, there should be greater resort to interim payments. And to that I will return in due course, because in my submission, the same policy arguments are engaged where there is an order for costs to be assessed uh, with interest running from the date of the order. So <clears throat> what we're dealing with on this appeal is the application of section 24, subsection 2, uh, to an anomaly. Uh, the anomaly is that there is a liability to pay interest which does not have to await the quantification of the principle for the liability to come into existence. The liability anomalously, in this case, exists even though no execution can be levied. And so there is a debt, but that debt does not become enforceable until a future date. And so, having established those conceptual basics, we turn then to the Act, which is in the first authorities bundle behind tab 5. And peer at the words of section 24 themselves. And that is on page 52. Um, and the starting point, as my learned friend submitted, is the word due. And in my submission, and really this is where we part, uh, where a liability to pay something has come into existence something is necessarily due. Uh, it does not matter that what is due has yet to be quantified. Uh, there is a present debt on which interest is accruing. It's all clear from the analysis in Hunt's case and Thomas and, and Bunn. What a costs order does is to pronounce that costs are due from one party to another. They are to be paid by one party to another Costs order creates the debt, which by statute carries interest, as we've seen the effect of Hunt's case um, and another case which we haven't looked at, but uh, which is Chohan's case, uh, which establishes for, for the purposes of section 24.1, an, uh, an order for costs to be assessed does not become enforceable until it has been quantified. Uh, what we have anomalously is a liability to pay, which cannot yet be enforced. Uh, and the key point in my submission, and as the judge noted, if a party subject to an order for costs to be assessed tenders a payment to the party to whom the costs 
are owed before quantification, it would have an effect necessarily on the underlying liability. Uh, it would either reduce it, uh, or if a sufficient amount, or indeed the full amount of the bill were tendered, it would extinguish it, provided I suppose the interest were, were tendered as well. Um, and in my submission, and as the judge rightly held, if a payment from one person to another would have that effect on an underlying ability, uh, liability, it strains the English language to suggest that nothing was nonetheless at that point due. Um, and indeed, it's an unnatural reading of the word due to suggest that in that situation, uh, despite the fact that a liability would be affected by a payment, nothing becomes due until a later date. Uh, the cost. Why, why isn't it simply tendered on account of what will become due? Uh, my lord, if you tender not the full amount of the bill, then it is tendered on account. But the, the tendering on account nonetheless affects the liability. It uh, reduces it because one has made a payment on account of what is going to be quantified. It is also possible that if a party decided that they had had enough of a detailed assessment, for instance, uh, and decided that they wanted to bring everything to an end, uh, it would be open to them to tender the full amount of the bill and any outstanding interest. And that would completely extinguish the liability. From that point, nothing would ever become due at the moment of quantification because the liability would have been swept away. Um, and indeed, um, That, that principle that there is a liability, that something is due, justifies the making of orders for payments on account and also interim cost certificates. They are orders that someone pay at an interim stage uh, money on account of what is already due from them. Um, my learned friend referred to the helpful discussion of uh, Lord Newberger when he was master of the roles in the second authorities bundle behind tab 28 in the Carl <coughs> case. Uh, there's nothing in my I submission. Just come back to your yes. point on re reduction. Um, there, there are two different concepts we're dealing with here. One might be categorised by the word owing, that is to say liability incurred or interest accrued, the other by payable in the sense of enforceable. Now, if you have uh, something which is accrued and become owing, but not yet payable and enforceable, then if there is a payment towards it, whilst it is owing, that will diminish or extinguish what is owing. And that will necessarily uh, extinguish or diminish what, what is payable. But how, how does that help you one way or another in deciding whether due here means owing stroke accrued or payable stroke enforceable? It's, it's consistent with either, isn't it? It is consistent. I, I suppose I'm bound to accept, my Lord, it's possible for it to be, for due to be read in both ways, and there is an ambiguity there. But the judge, in my submission, analysed this correctly uh, in her judgment, where she observed, as I've just submitted, that if um, a liability is outstanding, uh, so that if I make a payment, the liability is affected or reduced, it is uh, nonsense or nonsensical to suggest that nothing at the point that I make the payment is yet due. Uh, and conceptually, that, in my submission, is the better way of looking at it. Uh, if something does not become due until quantified, and incidentally, my lord, there's a difference between the point at which a cost order is quantified and the point at which it becomes enforceable, because, of course, the cost order will be pay it within 14 days or such other date as the court may, may specify. Um, due, um, if, or, if due means the point at which there is quantification, uh, but... I can extinguish entirely and therefore uh, prevent anything from becoming due at that point at all by tendering the total amount sought so that I extinguish the liability. The more natural reading of the phrase due is that it, uh, it, it refers back to the moment that the liability is actually incurred, the liability crystallises. And when we look at the policy arguments uh, in my submission, they will reinforce that reading, which is, of course, the reading that was adopted by the judge. <coughs> 
Um, and perhaps I can pray in a Lord Newberger's analysis in the Carlsberg case. Uh, and tab 28 in the second authorities bundle. And this is Lord Newberger considering the meaning of the words Jew and the phrase become Jew uh, through the lens of their ordinary and natural meaning. Uh, and at paragraph 39, as my learned friend identified, said that Jew would normally be understood to mean the amount which is to be paid, i.e. a present debt. In order for costs to be assessed, of course, establishes a present debt. It makes something due. Uh, and then in paragraph 40, he suggested that the natural meaning of the phrase become due is <coughs> become liable to be paid. And of course, interest becomes liable to be paid from the moment of the cost order being made. That is the effect of Hunt's case affirmed and clarified in Thomas and Bunn. Um, and so whether one approaches it as a matter of what is ordinary English does Jew mean, or whether one takes the analytical uh, approach that I did and the judge did in her judgment by asking, well, if I make a payment and it affects a liability, it is a nonsense to say that nothing is at that point due, one gets to the same result, which is that due most naturally means the date on which a liability first crystallised. What, what, what did Lord Newbigan mean by a, a present debt? Um, in that case, a debt which was in existence. And so we have seen in the cases a distinction between a contingent liability, a contingent debt, as my learned friend put it, I, the possibility of a debt arising in the future on the happening of a particular event, such as the demand in Walters, uh, that is, that would give rise to a present debt as distinct from a potential debt which has not yet been brought into being, like in the Toft case. Um, and turning finally <clears throat> to what my learned friend says about the word arrears, uh, as we've seen this has worked its way into section 24, subsection 2, through the process of consolidation. Um, and in fact, uh, notably in the Court of Appeal in Lowesley and Forbes, uh, section 24 2 was described as being a historical relic, uh, which I'm afraid isn't before you now, but in any event, that was overturned by the, the House of Lords. Uh, but the word arrears comes from those previous enactments, and we can still see the residue in the sections of the 1980 Act that my learned friend referred you to earlier this morning. Um, and for example, section 19, arrears of rent become due. Um, and um, if we, in fact, look at that section, which is on page, back in Authorities Bundle 1, on page 49, point of linguistic distinction between this and section 24.2. What it says is, and of course this applies only to action and not action and enforcement like 24.2, but what it says is that no action shall be brought to recover arrears of rent or damages in respect of arrears of rent after the expiration of six years from the date on which the arrears became due. And the distinction is with section 24, subsection 2, which doesn't use the word arrears in the second clause. I'm on page 52. It says, no arrears of interest in respect of any judgment debt shall be recovered after the expiration of six years from the date on which the interest became due, but not from which the arrears became due. And the point of distinction in my submission is that uh, the other sections uh, that the Act, the other sections of the Act that we looked at, 
deal with. So I'm not, not quite. Not quite your, your submission on section 19 is that due means the same as in section 24.2 or something? Uh, no, not quite, my lord, as I'm about to come on to develop. Uh, I'm noting, just for the time being, that section 19 bites on the point uh, on the date at which the arrears became due, whereas section 24 bites on when the interest became due, not when the arrears became due. I understand you've drawn that distinction, but so far as the word due is concerned, what, what do you say it means in section 19? Uh, well, in section 19, the word due necessarily coincides with the date at which something becomes enforceable. The time limit for action runs from the point at which the action could have been brought to enforce something. Now, there's necessarily a difference in section 24, because, as I've indicated, uh, a cost order will become enforceable after it has been made, because it will ordinarily order that interest be, sorry, that costs be paid within 14 days, or 28 days, or some other date. So the order uh, tells someone to do something, the interest uh, is due, but it doesn't become enforceable until after the expiry of the period of time within which they must pay it. Well, it's quite common in the course of heavy litigation for cost orders not, not to be payable or indeed to be assessed immediately. Um, well, of course, I accept you're that. Treating, you're treating as a typical cost order, one which is uh, immediately assessed and gives a time for payment. But, um, of course, we're familiar with those, but there are many cost orders uh, at interlocutory stages of heavy litigation which are going to have to await assessment at the conclusion of the litigation, which may itself be more than six years after the, after the order's been made. Um, yes, I, I accept that, my Lord, but in those cases, the interest nonetheless becomes due before the point at which the cost order becomes enforceable. Yes. And that is necessarily the difference about Section 24 uh, and the reason why the word enforceable is used, to, to draw a distinction between the point in time at which one can... Uh, bring an action for one's costs or like if one can enforce one's costs and the earlier date on which they actually became due. So the draftsman contemplates clearly costs becoming due before it is possible to enforce them by action. And that is the difference between this section and all of the other sections that use the phrase due. So those are section 19, uh, section 20 uh, and section 22 because they are uh, dealing with time limits on actions and time starts to run from when something becomes enforceable. So in those cases, in the other sections, due means that an action can be brought. Something is enforceable. In section 24, it means something different necessarily because something can be due even though it is not enforceable. Um, and returning, if I may, to the word arrears, in the case of an order, I'd be careful about using the word ordinary, in the case of an order that someone pay a quantified amount of costs, there is no difficulty in the use of the word arrears in the section because interest is in arrears from the day that the costs order pronouncing the liability and quantum is made. Uh, is that so? Or is it after the 14 days when the costs order is to be paid? Well, it depends on, what, on how the order is made, my lord, because if the order is silent as to interest, then under the Judgments Act, interest runs from the date of the order. That's the effect of Hunt's case and the incipitor rule. Uh, for a different order to be made, providing that interest shall run only from the date within which payment must be made, a different order would need to be made to postpone the running of time, which in my experience is, is not common. So in the common case of a summary assessment of costs, £10,000 to be paid within 14 days. Do they then start to carry interest until the end of the 14 days, or do they carry interest from the date of pronouncement of the order? Uh, no, they uh, carry interest from the date on the pronouncement of the order. That is the effect of the Judgments Act, because it simply says, um, if we just turn, turn it up. It says from the date of the judgment. Yes. Um, and So, strictly speaking... Um, after the 14 days, there should be some interest paid. Strictly speaking, yes. In practice, I think it is rarely pursued. Uh, perhaps normally because the summary assessment will be of costs which um, themselves perhaps might not be huge. But the, the way the wording is of the statute as it exists today behind uh, section, uh, sorry, behind tab two, um, is 
um, every judgment debt shall carry interest from such time as shall be prescribed by the rules of the court. And then we need to leave them to the CPR. So that, is, that is the date of judgment? Yes. 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 Um, so in, in that case, interest runs from the date of the order. There is no difficulty conceptually about it being in arrears from the first day if it is not paid. Um, the difficulty is that where the order is for costs to be assessed, uh, then uh, my learned friend says, well, there are no arrears until it has been quantified. In my submission, that is not conceptually correct. The order pronounces a liability to pay interest. And just as a pronouncement of an order to pay a quantified amount of costs, interest uh, runs from that date and becomes in arrears every day, it is not paid. Um, but, my lord, even if you're not with me on that, if we peer back at section 24, back on page 52. The wording is, as we've seen, no arrears of interest in respect of any judgment debt, no arrears of interest, shall be recovered after the expiration of six years from the date on which the interest became due. So even if my learned friend is right that some, that interest can only be arrears after uh, it has been quantified. Nonetheless, what the draftsman refers to in section 24.2 is not the date on which the arrears became due, but on which the interest became due. And that date might well be before, or would necessarily in that case, sorry, be before the date on which the quantum is pronounced. I was just looking up um, arrears uh, to see what it means, and <clears throat> at least the initial definitions which seem to turn up are money that is owed and should have been paid earlier. Well, interest by its nature. Out of, out of line with your submission, isn't it? Uh, in my submission, no, my lord, because uh, interest accrues because money is... Uh, in the old phrase, fructifying in the wrong pocket. A sum of money is in the, the pocket of the paying party, and it shouldn't be. Uh, from the date of the costs order, uh, that money, or the, the, li the liability to pay that money, has come into existence. In other words, it should have been paid from the paying party to the receiving party. It is anomalous that there is no execution that can be levied until quantification, but it is in the wrong pocket. It should have been paid. And therefore, consistently with the, de the definition uh, which my Lord Lord Mills has looked up, uh, interest is in arrears. But leave, leave aside any problems with quantification. If, if I'm a tenant and I, my rent has to be paid monthly in arrears and I pay it promptly at the end of each month, I don't think you'd say that there was ever any arrears of rent, would you? Well, that's the difference between something which is payable in arrear. I mean, payable backwards from the end of the month yes, and something that, which is that, 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 that as a matter of normal language you wouldn't say that there was any arrears of rent no if it was paid promptly because arrears is by reference to when it becomes payable not when it's been accruing over the course of the previous month I indeed think that's my, my lord's point about normal use of language see but in that case the tenancy agreement will stipulate or provide that rent shall be paid at the end of the month looking backwards. So it is in respect of a period that one has enjoyed possession of a particular property, but there is no liability to pay it until the end of the month. You pay for what you've had rather than what you are, uh, rather than what you are going to have. And so there is no, no, no rent can be said to be in arrears until the contractual payment date has arrived. No, it's accrued, but it's not in arrears. Um, well... I'm not sure my lord necessarily conceptually that, that it has accrued because uh, if I am a trespasser and I go into possession of land, then I incur a daily liability for every day that I'm wrongfully using the land. But if actually my tenancy agreement says I enjoy the land and I pay after the end of each month, nothing has accrued until the end of each month contractually. That's what the parties have agreed. I will enjoy the land for the month and then I will pay for it. But there's no accrual. Well, I'm not sure about that, but, but, but posit, posit, posit a tenancy which says that rent shall accrue from day to day and be payable at the end of each month. In then rent would, I suppose, be payable in arrear. 
that no rent would have become due on each day of each month. It would only become due at the end of the month when the contractual payment date arrives. Not on your interpretation of due. Uh, well, <coughs> my lord, in my suspicion... Accrued, accrued, due, i.e. accrued as a liability day by day during the month, but, but not payable until the end of the month. But the critical, um, the, the critical conceptual difference here is that a judgment debt brings into existence a liability to pay from the first day and accrues thereafter. The tenancy agreement situation that we're dealing with here doesn't involve um, any liability coming into force until the end or coming into effect until the end of the month. And that's the Barclays Bank and Walters situation, uh, where the, uh, this court held that due means become payable in accordance with the contractual terms that the parties have agreed. From that moment onwards, it is in arrears. But in the case of a judgment debt, that is not the situation, because something becomes due from the moment of the judgment, which brings the debt into existence. Um, so... Those are my submissions on the language. I'll turn now to the uh, cases relied upon by the bank, starting with Toft and Stevenson. Um, I, I don't think we necessarily need to turn it up because my learned friend went through it <coughs> yeah. thoroughly. The, the critical point, as my Lord, Lord uh, Popperwell identified and put, was that in that case, nothing was due because the contract hadn't been completed the liability was contingent upon title being shown. This was back in the glorious and much missed days of unregistered conveyancing, where a vendor had to prove their title by reference to the deeds over a certain number of years. Um, and that had not happened in Toft's case. It was never guaranteed that it would ever have happened, as my lady uh, rightly noted. Uh, uh, my lady, uh, this is just Dears, rightly noted. And so the distinction there is that nothing was due, and had title not been perfected, nothing ever would have become due. There were no arrears of anything until uh, the conveyance had been completed, and there would never be any arrears of anything if the conveyance was not uh, completed. Uh, and the decision is therefore not authority for the proposition uh, that interest on a judgment debt is not due until it is quantified, which is uh, the way that my learned friend puts on it. Um, and in my submission, the judge was quite right in the way that she dealt with it. Uh, that's in the main core bundle behind tab seven. Uh, and on page 82, at paragraph 46 of her judgment, She there correctly summarised the facts. She observed that the critical feature of the case was that the Court of Appeal held the right to receive the purchase price could not accrue until title had been perfected, which on the evidence it had not. And what she then said was that interest might then be backdated, but not until and, and unless it became due by completion of the contract. Uh, and my learned friend criticises the judge uh, on the basis that it appears from her judgment that uh, she distinguished the case because it was about a different factual scenario. But it is clear from her judgment and also from the argument below that the judge fully understood that the case was not um, binding on her because it simply didn't apply. If we just quickly turn up the supplemental bundle uh, and go to tab nine... Uh, and page 95, this is the submissions to the judge below. And at B and C, you will see what the judge said in argument about this. And having put the facts to my learned friend, she said, I do not think it is quite analogous to a case of detailed assessment where the order is made and a liability to pay interest is imposed but quantification is deferred. So she's correctly distinguishing the case in my submission. And if we look at what Mr. McLeod submitted next at D, he submitted that the obligation came into existence at the point at which the contract entered into. But of course, the judge recognised that that was not right. That was not what the facts were in Toft. Uh, 
there was no obligation to pay from the moment of the contract, only from the moment that title was shown and the contract completed, which had not happened. So for the reasons that the judge gave and expanded on a little bit in the argument uh, below, she was right to find that the case did not compel her to find for the bank. Uh, and for the same reasons, in my submission, the authority is of no relevance, so not binding on the, it does not compel the Court of Appeal today to find in favour of the bank for those reasons. So the, the reference in the last sentence of the Justice Turner's judgment to upon completion which just becomes due although can be calculated from the inception of the contract is to be interpreted on the footing that there was in that case a contractual right to interest from the date of contract to the date of completion if but only if which was a contingency yes completion took place that may have been uh, what the, the, the facts yes. that were before the court here but unfortunately neither of the reports make that clear. But the critical point, uh, as my Lord Lord proper well identified, is on page 86, uh, behind tab 12 of that authorities bundle, where Lord Justice Turner said, now when did the present right accrue to the plaintiff? That must depend upon the time when the title was shown upon the original contract. For the money did not become payable on the 30th of May 1811, the right would accrue upon the title being perfected by evidence. So as my Lord, uh, Lord Males put in an argument, this is a case of prematurity. Nothing was due. There was no right to an unpaid vendor's lien, and no right to have anything charged over the land. And, and so it doesn't help us. Uh, the next case, Barclays and Walters, uh, the critical point is that here the bank was suing on the covenant that the borrower gave to pay all sums due upon demand. And what the court found in that case was that interest was to be added half yearly to the principal. Uh, there was uncertainty about whether there was any obligation to make, uh, or an obligation to pay would be engaged if there were a default during the term. Uh, and, and that is what Lord Justice Nichols makes clear uh, in that passage that my Lord Lord Popperwell commented on whether it appears the word not is missing. So I'm on uh, tab 16 at uh, page 150. So for want of evidence, the Court of Appeal held that it seems to me, Lord Justice Nichols held, it seems to me that it is, uh, that it is not, or it seems to me that that is not a satisfactory basis, given that this particular matter was not brought before the court or considered in the court below, on which to found a conclusion that it was a term of this medium-term five-year loan agreement that if a payment in accordance with the monthly standing order was not duly implemented, the bank could at once have sued at Mr Walters for the £141 odd that instalment, or whatever the amount might be. So the bank was suing on a particular covenant to pay on demand, and what the case is authority for, the proposition that for the purposes of section 20, subsection 5 of the Limitation Act, there are no arrears of uh, interest on a mortgage until the contractually agreed time at which it falls due. And that is analogous to the case of rent payable at the end of the month that my Lord Lord Popwell and I were, uh, were discussing a few moments ago. Have I understood your submission? You, you do accept that in section 20, subsection 5, due means enforceably payable, not accrued? Uh, yes, it means that, or due means that an obligation to pay comes into existence. And it is, in, in the, looked at through the lens of the covenant to pay upon demand, it is also a contingent liability, because unless and until the bank serves a demand, the obligation to pay doesn't come into existence. And when we were looking at the statute, we drew our attention to the different form of wording in section 19. Yes, that's at page 49 of Authorities Bundle 1. 
And what's the difference in the, uh, the difference in the wording between subsection twenty five? Subsection twenty twenty four two five also uses the phrase on which the interest became due. So that's on page fifty one. Yes, as, as does as does subsection uh, as does twenty two subsection B, except. The, the relevant, well, I'm looking at 51, the relevant wording of section 20, subsection 5, is no action to recover arrears of interest, dot, 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 shall be brought until expiration of the date on which interest became due. And in 24.2, it's no arrears of interest shall be recovered after expiration of six years from the date on which the interest became due. Why, why does due mean something different in the two sections um, of language? Well, in my submission, my lord, due in section 20, subsection 5, means the point at which the liability to make a payment comes into existence. Due in section 24, subsection 2, also means the date at which a liability to make a payment comes into existence. The necessary difference between the two uh, statutory provisions is that section 20, subsection 5, deals with the bringing of an action and imposes uh, or starts limitation running from the point at which the, mortgage, uh, the mortgagee could have brought an action to recover the arrears of interest. I'm so sorry, it's my fault. I, I thought you were accepting in subsection 5 of section 20, due meant enforceable. But yes. But you, you are accepting that? Yes, because the point at which time starts to run is the point at which the mortgagee can bring an action for the arrears. In other words, the point at which the obligation to make the payment has become enforceable by action. Right. Uh, and that is at the territory of section 24, subsection 1 on judgment debts. So but time that, starts to but run. Due, but due in section 24, 2 means something different. Uh, yes, my lord, necessarily. As I've what, what is your explanation? Uh, either as a matter of policy or as a matter of the wording of the two subsections on why it should mean something different in the two subsections. So let me be clear about what I'm saying conceptually, my lord. Just taking for the time of section 20, subsection 5 and 24, subsection 2, yes. in both cases I say that the word due refers to the moment that a liability to pay something has crystallised. The necessary distinction in section 24. So, 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 so it's my fault, because I thought a moment ago you accepted in section 25 it means has become enforceable, but you're, you're, you're not saying that. Yeah, you're well, saying in se let me, section 25, due means what you say it means in 24.2, i.e. Uh, a liability which exists but is not yet enforceable. So in section 20, subsection 5, yes. due means the point at which a liability came into existence, but it is also for the purposes of that section the point at which the liability became enforceable. Necessarily because time for bringing an action starts to run on the date that the liability came into existence, i.e. the date on which it became enforceable. The conceptual difference in section 24 is that due refers to the date on which a liability to pay something came into existence, but uh, because of section 24, one, that does not coincide with the date on which the right to enforce it accrued. And that is because of the particular nature of a judgment debt, which will say, ordinarily, you will pay this amount within this amount of time. Something becomes due and later becomes enforceable. I'm still not quite grasping it. But both sections talk, mm. of, talk about an action to recover arrears of, of interest. Section 24, subsection 2, uh, doesn't talk about action. It just talks about recovery. And because of the House of Lords decision in Lowesley and Forbes, we know that that refers to recovery by action or execution. I see. So I section see. 24, see. 1 starts time running from the date on which something becomes enforceable. I'm following. So it's, it, the, the essential distinction in the wording is that subsection 5 of section 20 involves uh, an action, which will yes. necessarily mean an entitlement to... Exactly, to, yes. to, to pay. Quite similar. I'm and sorry, incidentally, I'm being slow. I'm there now. even on the bank's case, uh, the word due in section 
24, subsection 2, does not mean enforceable. Their case is that a liability to pay costs becomes due at the date of the final certificate, which pronounces the costs. But of course, the final certificate will say this amount is to be paid within 14 days. So even on the bank's case, your liability to pay costs doesn't become enforceable for some time after it has become payable. So logically, I think we're all in agreement, or both sides are in agreement, that in section 20, subsection 5, uh, the word due refers to the point at which the liability crystallised and also became enforceable. Whereas in section 24, 2, the word due refers to the point at which a liability crystallised or came into existence, but not the date on which that liability became enforceable by action. Um, and that is why I say that the judge was right in the way that she dealt with uh, Walters, which we see in paragraph 45 of her judgment on page 81. And at the end of paragraph 44, she recognised that Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal, holding that the interest was not due within the section until it fell due for payment, which in this case, upon the expiration of the five-year period. <coughs> she then, although accept her reasons for departing from the case in paragraph 45, are, are not developed in any particular detail, but she appreciated that the section was different, operated in a different way, um, and was not binding on her to conclude that due in section 24, subsection 2, necessarily coincided with the point uh, at which something was either enforceable or had been, become quantified. And just in that connection, my lords, my lady, if you turn to paragraph 15 of her judgment, over on page 76, she addresses again very briefly um, the other periods of the that we've been looking at. And at paragraph 16, she notes correctly that all of those are directed at the bringing of suit rather than the process of execution. And she correctly had latched onto the fact that in all of those cases, the, there was a, a, a coincidence of time when something became due and when something became enforceable, which was not the case in section 24. And uh, so... Again, my submission, the judge was right to find that that decision was not authority for the proposition that was urged on her by the bank, uh, and nor does it require uh, this court to make that finding either. Um, I'd better just address the point that was raised against me about the respondent's notice as well. Um, the first point to make about that is that Mr... McLeod submits in his skeleton that all of these authorities are... It's all are. right. I don't think you need to hear any speech. Um, so very briefly then, uh, before lunch, um, just uh, come on to the other cases that Mr McLeod relies upon, although, again, you may not need me to touch on them. That's the, the Regent for Thanet case concerning council tax regulations. That's a contingent liability which comes into existence only upon demand. The same thing is true of um, the Sutherland and Secretary of State for Work and Pensions case. It concerns a contingent liability. Um, but again, in my submission, the takeaway from all of these cases is that uh, an amount becomes due when the liability to pay it first crystallises and the debt comes into existence. Um, so we come on to the policy uh, and the mischief. Um, as we've seen, the judge held that the section operates as uh, what she conceptualised as a statutory cap. And we see that at paragraph 80, um, sorry, page 80 and 81 of the bundle, at, at paragraph 40 of her judgment. Right at the bottom of page 40, she held, accordingly in my judgment, the intention of Parliament was, uh, as I submitted, to impose a statutory cap on the amount of interest that could be recovered whenever a judgment came to be enforced. Uh, now, 
in my submission, she's quite right to conceptualise uh, the statute in that way because that is the clear policy which underpins the section. And that is clear from the decision of the House of Lords in Lowesley and Forbes, which is in the first authorities bundle behind tab 20. And my learned friend observed that it's not been possible to locate a copy or report of the decision of Mr. Justice Tucky at first instance. But on page 208, Lord Lloyd explains what Mr. Justice Tucky had concluded at first instance. I'm at C. The first question is whether section 24 1 bars execution of a judgment. Um, if the answer is, as the plaintiffs contend, uh, that it only bars a fresh action, the second question is whether, when a judgment is executed after six years, interest on the judgment is limited under section 24 subsection 2 to a period of six years before the date of execution. Tucky J answered the first question in favour of the plaintiffs and the second question in favour of the defendant. So that is the, the clearest setting out of what exactly it was that Mr Justice Tucky held. And it's right to note there that retrospectivity introduced by the word before. You have a period of interest uh, six years before the date of execution. In other words, at the date of execution, one must look back six years, interest, uh, that, that six years worth of interest is what you're entitled to recover. Now, um, there may be something conceptually between us. It was uh, my Lord Lord Mayles uh, suggested that, uh, in fact, we were both accepting that there was a statutory cap which operated backwards from uh, the point in time at which uh, one comes to enforce. Uh, what Mr. McLeod said was that, in fact, time starts running from the moment that the debt is due and then cuts off at some point. Um, I confess I, I, I didn't completely clearly understand whether he was disavowing the suggestion that, in fact, one takes the point of execution and goes back six years, or whether one looks at the point at which the liability becomes due and counts forward six years and then says that after that nothing can be recovered. But in my submission, the way the Act works is in this retrospective manner that the judge accepted. And that is clear from the formulation of Mr. Justice, Tucky's, Mr. Justice Tucky's decision. One starts the point of execution and one works back six years. This, this was a case of a judgment for a fixed amount. So the point that we're concerned with simply didn't arise. So expressing it in that way doesn't really tell us what, what the position would have been. If, if there's a difference. I accept that, my Lord, but what it does tell us is what the policy underlying the Act is. And I make that submission on the basis of what follows, because if one turns over onto page 217, Lord Lloyd there accepts uh, that Mr Justice, or prefers the decision of Mr Justice Tucky, limiting to a period of six years. And then his lordship goes on to consider the argument about section 32. What he holds is that section 32 of the 1980 Act does not extend time for the purposes of execution under section 24, subsection 2 of the Act. It only extends time for bringing an action on a judgment under section 24, subsection 1. So in other words, the House of Lords was untroubled by the conclusion that it reached that even where a judgment debtor fraudulently conceals some fact relevant to enforcement, it doesn't matter. At the point of enforcement, one still is only allowed to go back six years. And that conclusion, in my submission, does reinforce what I said below and what I say here is the policy underpinning the Act, which is to place, for the benefit of judgment at debtors, a six-year cap on the amount of interest that can ever be recovered on a judgment debt, working backwards from the point of enforcement. That's what the judge accepted. What is the policy? The policy. Why, 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 why should judgment debtors, even with the benefit of concealment, because Section Thirty Two doesn't apply, um, have a have a have a six year cap from the date of the order rather than from the date of 
the obligation to pay? Uh, because, my lord, what it does is to encourage creditors to enforce their judgments with alacrity. Well, well, hold on. Does, okay, take, the, take these one at a time. Uh, the, the judgment creditor can only do that in the situation we're concerned with once the assessment's taken place. So having it run from an earlier date um, is unfair to the judgment creditor in that respect. It's not that policy consideration of, of use it or lose it, which is which is one of the themes one sees in the yes. policy encouragement of, of those who have debts to pursue them promptly. It doesn't apply, I accept, or that policy justification doesn't work in this particular case. But I say the judge found that that doesn't matter because any injustice created by delay can be uh, <coughs> substantially remediated by applying for and obtaining interim cost certificates during the assessment. But in every other case where there is a judgment for a fixed amount, it does encourage judgment creditors to enforce within that six-year period. Um, and it removes the temptation uh, to sit on a judgment debt and treat it as an investment where interest on the judgment debt is running... Uh, it has been fairly recently 8%, which is considerably above the commercial rate. But the debtor can avoid that by making the payment. Uh, yes, I suppose that is also the case, my Lord, but that is, uh, okay. were that the case, Parliament would not have imposed any limitation at all on um, recovery of interest on a judgment. So that... Yeah, is there is, I mean, there is, there is a cap of six years, uh, as my Lord says. We simply have to decide uh, wh whether it runs from the date of the order or the date of the assessment. But I'm just trying to explore with you what policy reasons there are for it running from the date of the order rather than the date of assessment. Um, and on the one hand, date of assessment fulfills the policy of use it or lose it, so far as a judgment creditor is concerned. Yes. From the judgment debtor's point of view, he's not uh, disadvantaged uh, in the judgment uh, rate of interest of accruing uh, at what, what has traditionally, at least recently, been greater than commercial interest rates, because he can make a payment uh, which will uh, stop the interest running. But then conversely, you say, and I'd just like to explore this, well, um, the, the judgment creditor can always protect his position by getting an, uh, uh, an interim certificate. And I understand you say that in the context of all the expiry of the period of time being during an assessment. But what about the case where uh, at early stage of a claim uh, there's an application to amend and an order is made that the costs of an occasion by the amendment or costs thrown away are to be paid by uh, the amending party in any event. It's not possible to make an assessment at that stage, and in the normal way, costs won't be assessed until after the action's over, indeed after any appeals are over, which may well be six years after that order's been made. How, how does the judgment creditor, who's had to pay his legal advisors those costs and he's out of the money, protect himself against that? Um, I think there are a number of responsible Lord. First of all, as you've said, in the ordinary way, the costs won't be assessed until the conclusion of the proceedings, but it is still an order for costs <coughs> to be assessed, which can, on which detailed commencement can be commenced. Now, in the ordinary way, it isn't, but that is uh, by convention and not by anything in the rules. There is nothing preventing someone with an interlocutory cost order from commencing assessment during the proceedings, in particular, if uh, they were running up against the uh, period of limitation or if they were running up against the six-year cap. It would be nothing. There would be nothing objectionable about them doing that. And the second point is that if uh, well, there, uh, might, there, might, there might be, if the litigation is still ongoing, the other party would say there's no point having an assessment now. Um, the overall position may be that I'm I'm entitled to much more in the way of costs. But my lord, if the six-year cap were running out, that argument would lose its force because the person who's been ordered to pay the cost of amending would say, well, in the ordinary way, you might be right. But if we don't do this now, we risk losing interest that we would otherwise be entitled to recover. Therefore, we are doing it now. And the interest of justice in that situation, I submit, would point very firmly to allowing a detailed assessment to commence. And what, what would happen if the other party said, well, you can't tell what the costs have been thrown away by the amendment uh, until we've had the trial and see which arguments succeed and which lose? So, my lord, so it, an, an order for costs thrown away by an amendment 
well, that would operate retrospectively. In other words, there would have been costs which had by that point been incurred, which had been incurred on something that was ab abandoned. In other words, it is possible, all those costs have been wasted and incurred, it is possible for a cost judge to carry out an assessment of what those costs were and to quantify them. It would be a question for the cost judge, but the files would all be available. It's just one of the many challenges which comes up frequently on detailed assessment. There's a cost order for a particular thing. The cost judges do their best to identify what the costs are and to make an order on a broad brush basis. But in principle, there is nothing stopping the party who has that cost order from commencing detailed assessment before they run up against the statutory cap. Don't look at that clock, it's wrong. <laughs> um, Two it, minutes to one. Oh, I see. Thank you, my lady. Um, so uh, just to respond, that's these, right. yes. to respond on these policy arguments, there are a couple of cases that I'd, I'd just like to take you to, but I think that probably won't take less than two minutes. Um, so I wonder if now might be a convenient moment. Two o'clock, please.